I'm going to start with a little bit about value types because they're an important motivation for why I think you should use uh, type erasure. And I'm not going to uh, stick on that too much because there's been other talks uh, that cover this very well and it would about double the size of my talk. <laughs> then I'm going to talk about why we use polymorphism at all from first principles, what are we trying to achieve with it, and I'm going to show you why the current solutions that we commonly use are inferior to type erasure. And uh, let's start with value types. Oh, Jesus, really? It is. Awesome. Okay. So um, if you deal with value types instead of reference types, by references I mean you know, pointers and references. If you deal with value types, you get nice uh, ownership and lifetime semantics, and you get equational reasoning. And what I mean by the first one is uh, exemplified by this problem right here. We have a foo factory. It returns a foo t star. If we use that factory to make a foo, what can we say about foo, right, in terms of ownership? Like, do I delete it? Is it held internally by this factory? Do I increment a ref count uh, now that I have it or decrement one when I'm done with it or something to get rid of it? How do, how do I get rid of this thing? And if I give it to someone else, they have to ask the same questions. So maybe this is better. Right now, I don't have to worry about when to actually delete a foo, but now I have shared state in the best case. In the worst case, I have global state. Okay, so <clears throat> while it's better in terms of not having to worry about um, the specific uh, destruction of the object to use shared pointer, you're still in the business of dealing with lots of bits of code and trying to understand all those bits of code and how they interrelate to each other. Okay, so that leads me to our equational reasoning. We've got the same foo factory. Now we've got a function foo user that uses that uh, the result of the output of that factory, right? So in some function, if I make a, a foo t from the factory, and then I say I want to uh, use that, I'm passing the pointer by value. So I know the pointer uh, value did not change, but I can't say much else about foo, right? It could have been deleted by that function. It could have had some mutating operation that I didn't anticipate. It could have a non-mutating operation that influences what I do afterwards. So you know, have you ever heard this thing about how you have like seven registers in your head? Right, you have basically seven bits of information you can hold at one time. Well, you don't want to spend those seven registers outside of the place uh, you're writing code. Right? You don't want to have to reason simultaneously about the code you're writing here and then also the code that you're uh, calling transitively for every function call you, you have. So whenever you use mutable references, you let those objects leak out. You then have to reason about what's going on elsewhere, not just where you're writing code. All right. Oh, and I forgot, there was a little note I was going to say at the beginning. Um, all the code you're going to see today, I, I slurped it up with a tool, so all the code you see compiles and runs. So every once in a while, you might see something that looks like an example. It's not. It's, it's real code. Okay. So the reason we use polymorphism is for code reuse, right? Here is a function that has limited reuse because I've got uh, an object of type sum t. The only thing I can pass to this function is a sum t object or maybe uh, something derived from that if I don't care about slicing, right? So I have to use this poly non-polymorphically, right? So if instead I give you a, a const ref parameter that you can pass to this function, now I can use this base t in this case, this type, and then anything derived from that, and I can use this runtime polymorphically. This is the traditional you know, um, inheritance based polymorphism but you have to use inheritance. And I'm going to show you why you don't want to do that. Now this is a little bit better in a lot of cases. You've got a template now, so now I can take any type T and compile time polymorphically, I can have any such type, and as long as the uh, template gets instantiated with the right semantics and without you know, breaking the build, then this works. The problem is that the polymorphism that I care about for the purposes of this talk is runtime polymorphism. So you can do this, but you're usually, you're usually stuck in compile time polymorphism land once you do this. And it's hard to get out. Type erasure is the way to get out of that. Um, and this is an important point, I feel. Um, this line here where it says this here, um, I'm going to assert is not, uh, is not a polymorphic use of that object. And the reason I say that is because polymorphic use of an object means that I can substitute a this for a that. There's an is a relationship there. In this case, I have, to, I have to retain extrinsic state that tells me that it's okay to do this cast. 
Okay? I've got this function foo that does not appear in the base class, and I want to use it in derived. I have to know that it exists because all I have is a pointer to base, and that doesn't exist in the pointer to base. So right here, it's not a problem because I know from the context, because the previous line I, I um, you know, allocated this object, that it has, does have that interface. But in the you know, typical case, you will find people doing this kind of stuff with a static cast or a dynamic cast when they know for some reason that that is the most derived type of that object and they can get at that interface. Or in the worst case, they're doing uh, you know, a block of uh, if this dynamic cast works, if that dynamic cast works, and trying to find interfaces they're looking for. So that is not a polymorphic use of this object, and I'll return to that later when we talk about uh, benefits of other kinds of polymorphism besides type erasure. Okay, so um, as we already touched on, we're going to do inheritance-based polymorphism and uh, template-based polymorphism. First, you know the benefits of inheritance-based polymorphism. Hopefully, I'm going to show you some problems with it, uh, that most of which you're probably already familiar with. So when we have uh, everything when we have our polymorphism based on um, derivation, we're limited to whatever exists in that base class's API, right? We have to say um, down in this function, some function, if I have uh, a pointer to base and its type, most derived type is derived, I can use that in this uses foo function because I know that that part of that API exists in the base class. I can't use it in this you know, fictional uses bar function because even though the most derived type, of, you know, the, the thing at the end of that pointer has that API, I can't get to it. Now, this is one way of looking at it. I just showed before how you can do it with a cast, but you either have to limit yourself to this, or, oh, and by the way, the base class could be, you know, multiply derived, some multiply derived type. Uh, it doesn't have to be a single base class. That's not what I'm saying by this. But whatever point in your um, class hierarchy you decide to pick as uh, the type of pointer that you're going to use to refer to all your objects polymorphically, whatever that type is, you're limited to that public interface. Or you can try to bolt on interfaces later on. So in order to do this, uh, you know, I've had to use virtual inheritance here, right? This is the classic problem. You don't want to use virtual inheritance. You get this diamond of death that's virtual inheritance, and that's fear and dark side <laughs> results. Okay, so, so you don't want to write code like that, right? You don't want it to, again, return to the need to extrinsically remember that uh, this object has this certain interface on it and do that dynamic cast, right? That is not a polymorphic use of this, of this uh, object. And you can't take different classes from different uh, class hierarchies and make them interoperable in the same set of functions that you want to pass them to, right? Because they don't have a common base. So if I've got this int foo and float foo, um, they, they have incompatible foo functions. These log functions look like I should be able to use them in multiple places though, right? But because I don't have a, a common base class, I'm, I'm sort of stuck. So what I end up doing is writing an overload for each one of these. Maybe that's a template that generates the overloads for me, if it's a very simple implementation. But in either case, I'm, I'm generating, excuse me, object code for both of those uh, when I don't necessarily need to, or I, result to, I mean, resort to using a base class that allows me to do the logging. And if there's some other common operation besides logging I want to do on everything, then I have to have another common base that everything uh, derives from as well. It's, uh, you know, uh, again, not code we want to write. Okay, so um, for that same reason, we can't take interface and implementation and separate them easily, right? I want to have a function that says, this is what I expect the things that you're using to look like, and anything that conforms that interface, I will accept it. Um, but we cannot do that once we're using uh, inheritance without using multiple inheritance to basically separate the interface and the implementation. We can't truly have the implementations totally divor di uh, divorced from one another. We have to have them with a common base so we can use the, the inheritance mechanism. All right, so virtual functions are you know, tricky in a variety of ways. Um, we've seen real problems where people will create a new uh, overload that is not, uh, or a new override rather, it's not a real override. It's just a misspelling of an override so you get the wrong virtual function called, right? So override and final help with that. Um, but there's a bigger problem, which is the, there's a lack of consistent idiom in our industry for what to do with a virtual function implementation. So if you get dropped into an object hierarchy, or class hierarchy rather, and you want to write a new virtual function, you have to know what the conventions are for the rest of the virtual functions in that hierarchy. Because some places say like, 
do not call uh, the superclasses version of this virtual function. Some places say always do that. Some places say you should have a non-virtual interface and do your virtual functions as implementations of the non-virtual interface, which is the public interface. Like, so in other words, don't have public virtual functions. There, there's, uh, there's a big mess that requires you to, when you're dropped into something new, you haven't seen this class hierarchy before, that you have to read a lot of other code to figure out what the right thing is to do. Um, and of course, inheritance uh, imposes very tight coupling because the need to derive from a common base. You can't have these totally diff, uh, separate uh, types uh, like you would have if you, you, know, you have your class hierarchy and you want to add something to it. Uh, you're not able to um, do that without, of course, deriving from a common base class. And that means whenever you touch that base class header, you have to recompile the world. Again, we want things to be more separate than that. And, of course, we're doing everything with reference semantics. We don't get the nice value semantics that I was alluding to earlier. Okay, so a quick motivating example. We've got widgets and layouts. A widget is a UI element, like a button or a text box. A layout places widgets in the UI, right? That's what it does. A layout contains widgets, because that's what it needs to operate on. But it, you also want it to contain sub-layouts. And the reason you want to do this is because Layout code is going to be fiddly and complicated and hard to get right. So if you've got some big layout and it's got uh, essentially three columns of, of widgets in it, you don't want to have a layout class that says, well, I know about how many columns or boxes or a grid or something like that. It's much harder to get right than to just say, I've got horizontal layouts and I've got vertical layouts and I can mix and match these to make any layout that I want. So as soon as you decide that you want to have a sub layout and a widget in the same uh, layout uh, function, then if you're using inheritance, you're pretty much tied to saying a layout is a widget or a widget is a layout or they're both some, some thing that they're commonly derived from, okay? If you look at QT's implementation, uh, they do this, right? They derive a widget from layout or the other way around. I wrote a UI library that did the same thing and this is stupid, right? <laughs> I should not have done this. Uh, arguably, they should not have done this either. You don't want a widget that is a layout. You don't want a layout that is a widget. That, that doesn't make any semantic sense, right? It's hard to reason about code that has a kind of false relationships. Okay, so templates do solve a lot of the problems I just mentioned, but um, there are a whole host of problems that go with metaprogramming. Um, I won't go over these in great detail. Essentially, um, you need a lot of specific information, I mean, specific knowledge on how to do template metaprogramming in order to do it. Other people at your work maybe don't have that same knowledge and can't maintain or read or understand what you've done. And for that reason, places simply make it verboten to use those, right? And then um, on top of everything else, you can't get the runtime polymorphism that I'm talking about, at least not without type erasure. So for example, we've got this function, this factory function that um, works great at compile time, right? In terms of figuring out what the return type of this function should be. If I give it a true type, a false type, and some uh, compile time constant selection, I can use std conditional, and based on selection, I can either default construct an uh, object of true type or an object of false type, right? That first one works great. I have this uh, int and this float I'm pulling out of it, uh, and that all works just fine. Now, if I want to make that uh, a runtime switch instead of a compile time switch, so I write auto, trust me, I'm going to figure it out in a bit, and then the name of the function, and then I've got this selection. So in that uh, part at the end, I, like, ooh, can you see that? Not really? All right, well, right where I've got the first set of question marks, I want to put something in the trailing return type there in terms of selection that gives me a return type, but I can't because that's, a comp that's not a compile time constant, that's a runtime value, okay? So with type erasure, you can do stuff like this. The examples like this are, are not what I'm getting at, but the point is that once you're stuck in the, um, template metaprogramming world, or once you enter it, you're stuck there, right? And um, so it's not, even though it solves a lot of the, the classic problems we have in inheritance, it, it doesn't uh, solve our runtime polymorphism problem. I just want to ask a question. You know, this is near and dear to my heart. I thought about this 10 years ago when I was in my downstairs bathroom. <laughs> there was a very important thing that I was trying to figure out. And I thought, well, this is the implementation details. They don't propagate into the interface. And one of the things about template implementation policy Um, of something which doesn't affect the functionality is nonetheless a different type and causes a vocabulary problem. Right, so the question is, 
Am I talking about things like vector having an allocator and that coloring the type and making that type different from another vector with a different allocator? Vector right. Event, vector event with my allocator. Yes. Right. Vector event versus vector event with my allocator. I'm, you, about I'm not strictly talking about that. I'm uh, that that is an example uh, in, in addition to what I'm talking about. I think um, because you could have a essentially a vector interface which is an erased vector type that has these different kinds of vectors behind it with different allocators and you use them all the same. But in this specific example, I'm, I'm specifically talking about doing template metaprogramming heavy code to get around all the problems that you have with, I mean, with a traditional um, inheritance-based polymorphism. I've seen a lot of people do this instead, and you end up compiling everything every time you want to do something, and you have poor runtime polymorphism opportunities when you need them. But did you have something else? Okay, but it's worse than that because it's not about recompilation. It's about incompatibility. It's about right. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's right. So the comment was that um, it's also about interoperability, right? Using these two kinds of vectors, your vector of int and my vector of int with a different allocator, using them the same way because they conform to a, the same interface. And that's exactly what I'm getting at, yeah. Okay, so surely we can do better, right? Um, so that is type erasure, of course. And based on everything we've seen so far, this is the kind of code we want to write, okay? We want to have no coupling, so I've got these types foo and bar. They both have a value uh, a member that looks about the same. And uh, we have no virtual functions, sort of. We'll see that in the implementation details of the type ratio technique, there's virtual functions. We use virtual function dispatch on the covers. Um, and there's no templates, right? So I've got int value of, and I take some magical type obj, and the, or mag, uh, some object of this magical type, and then I call its value member, and then I return whatever that is. And this, again, is real code that does what you think it does. And um, then in some function, I can use these objects around all over the place, and they have nice value semantics, right? So I'm creating these things on the stack. I'm not creating them on a heap. I'm passing them by value, and, uh, and everybody's happy, okay? So how do we make that magic type? This is... Um, sort of a straw man. This is uh, anything, which is very similar to boost any or the upcoming std any. And uh, it's best looked at from bottom up. So look at the data member on the bottom. It's a unique pointer to a handle base. We call that handle, okay? And that handle base is that um, first struct. And handle base is very simple. It just has a virtual destructor and has a virtual clone uh, function. And that's a pure virtual clone function. And then it's got a, um, uh, the anything type also has this handle template. Now the handle is just a way of saying, for some type T, we want to have something derived from handle that will have the actual implementation. And that just has a, a T uh, value data member and uh, it implements the clone function and it's got a constructor that takes uh, a value of that type T that it was templatized with and, uh, and stores that, right? So uh, this is the, these are the definitions of those uh, declared, declared functions. So, you know, the remove reference there is kind of noise. There's a couple of corner cases where you need it, but you can essentially think of the first one as if I, if I give you an object of type T, I'm going to make a new handle, right? Handle, remember, is the, the templatized type, the most derived type. So I'm going to make a new handle, and I'm going to make it with uh, this optionally moved in object of type T, okay? Then I've got a copy constructor that's also very straightforward. The copying constructor is just cloning the internal handle uh, in, into you when you do the, the copy, right? So notice that we are uh, doing dynamic allocation just to do a copy here. And um, then the assignment operator and the, uh, well, both the assignment operators, the, the one that takes any object and the one that assigns from and anything are both, you know, just using the, uh, the, the previous two uh, members there uh, using the copy and swap idiom, okay? So now this is the only other two definitions we need, the, the anything handle definitions, okay? So one is uh, gonna take uh, a value of type T and move it into the internal storage, and the other one is just going to make uh, a new uh, handle on the heap with that uh, data member copied into it. So every operation we're, we're looking at here where we're um, either making uh, an erase type, we are copying, assigning, we're always gonna copy the underlying object and we're gonna do a heap allocation in addition. So if the underlying object you know, touches heap, when, it's, when it gets copied, that, that could be a problem. So we'll look at how to optimize this, but 
This is the simplest form of type erasure and, and one you might have seen before. Sort of the purpose of the talk is that this isn't the only way to do type erasure in the sense that there's way more optimal ways to do this and I'm gonna show them to you shortly. So this is what anything does for you. It's, it's like I said, like boost any, you can take an int or a pointer to an int and give it an anything a, you can say a equals that int or a equals that pointer. You can assign a double to it, a string to it, a, a foo to it, right? Almost anything. So this gives us duct typing like in Python and I've actually started recommending to people uh, that they have something like this in their C++ code base if they care about scripting and they're starting a new project where they're gonna do scripting, don't bind to you know, whatever language you're, you're using like uh, Lua and Python, they're great scripting languages and when you get to a certain point you're spending all of your time trying to work out the changes in the bindings from one language to the other. If you have a bunch of interfaces to functions on the C++ side, whenever you want to expose a new interface or a new type, you just you know, have some string to uh, type mapping somewhere and then your uh, scripting language, your, um, uh, you, you essentially have no binding layer. You have no, no work you have to do to bind one to the other, right? So you can define all your interfaces using type erasure and you get duct typing, but that's happening in C++, not in this other language. Um, for what it's worth, it, that's, uh, that's a pretty nice way to do things. Okay, so anything cannot actually really hold anything. It can hold anything that is uh, copyable, right? So it should maybe be called copyable. Uh, for exposition, I just called it anything. So how do we get back to this? How do we get back to doing stuff like on this slide, right? We didn't see any way to actually call a value uh, data member on some arbitrary type that we put into our anything, so how do we get there? Well, it's actually very simple, if repetitive. We just take the value data member that we want on the anything, we put it there, and then all it does is call value on its handle, okay? So then we need a pure virtual uh, value method on the, um, uh, on the base class, and then the actual implementation on the uh, template drive class, okay? Does this kind of make sense? Is it unclear to anybody? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so what? What is it that you're unclear about? Is this? <laughs> I, I'm actually unclear. The, the reason I'm unclear, and, and, and I know, I think, I thought mm -hmm. that I might be wrong. I thought I knew what what type erasure was before I came in, which means to me that it's it, it, there are people that feel the same way. And again, I'm, tr I'm just trying to help. Sure. Um, to me, type erasure. This. Let me just summarize what I think it is. And maybe other people think that because of the way shared pointer works, you have a factory method in the constructor that constructs for you some derived type and turns compile time polymorphism into a, a runtime polymorphic thing that disappears. And the important thing about type erasure is that it's all contained within the same class, which differentiates it from both the way C++ 98 deals with vectors and the way we're about to move towards a, a polymorphic resource. So we have three different things. We have C++ 98 and vectors and allocators that are compiled time. We have type erasure, which is contained within the class and the factory lives there in the constructor as a template constructor. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is you pass in the base class of the resource, which I've been doing since 1997. Side. We might make it into 2017, who knows? But the thing is, there are three different things going on here, and I'm trying to understand, again, I'm trying to be clear, what is it that this is trying to do that is similar to the way shared pointer uses type erasure? Okay, so the question, if I can boil it down, the, the question, the question is, um, how does this relate to the example of like shared pointer and its, its deleter is what you're talking about, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay. So uh, shared pointer has a deleter that you can give it. It can be any old deleter, anything that when you give it a pointer, it does the deletion it's supposed to do, right? So it has a, a member function delete or something like that. I don't remember its API, but it's something where you, it's some kind of an API that's known in advance and anything you give it, it will uh, be able to use that uh, API of that object, right? These objects don't have to know about each other. And this is exactly what we're doing here, right? Instead of containing that within a larger object, we've got anything that has a value member, I can stick it in this thing, right? So inside of shared pointer, there's a holder of some kind that you're putting your deleter into, right? That deleter is an erased type. And that deleter is gonna call delete on that object and pass it the 
pointer that it's managing or, or what have you, right? Does that kind of make sense? That totally makes sense exactly right now. What is our objective here compared to that? I just, that one part I didn't get. There's no difference in the objective there. The objective is the same. The idea is if I have divergent types that have nothing to do with each other, I want to be able to use them with a common interface. That's, that's the point underpinning this whole thing. And that is a form of runtime polymorphism, right? And it's a better way to do runtime polymorphism than inheritance. So I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for a while. okay. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. So we can add any API we want. We added value, but we could add you know log or dump or whatever crazy thing we want to put in there. And um, it's easy to do, but it's very repetitive to do this. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. So now let's let's return to this widgets and layouts example I started with. So if we have these two disjoint APIs we need to support, right? Um, we can make these erased types. So I've cut out the boilerplate here, right? All the, the copy constructors and the, the three times repeated uh, uh, member function and stuff like that. So you've got the idea, uh, some, some widget type, right? That is, can be rendered with this render member. And then a layoutable type, which has this geometry member that gives you its layout geometry you can use to do its layout, okay? So, <clears throat> Here's a button object that we, or button type we create, and it's got a render method and a geometry method. It's got some other member functions in here too, and, and that's fine, but it's got the two that we need so that we can use it as a widget or as a layoutable, right? So with this function do layout, I take any layoutable L, and I say, okay, give me its geometry, and then I'll do its layout. Render widget says, give me any widget W, and I'll say, render that W, and, and we're done, okay? So, now this function down here, I've got a button on the stack. I say do its layout and then render the widget. Now I, I'm doing a, I'm making a copy of this button, so it's not like I'm mutating the button in that operation. Uh, we'll get to get to that kind of thing in a second. But this is real code and this works and this does what what I'm advertising. All right. So performance is a little wonky for these things because, like I said before, we're copying the underlying object. We're touching heap almost every time, so we can we can do better. But first, let's look at what we're doing right now. So function call overhead, once you've got one of these things made, uh, once you've got an erase type uh, constructed and it's got its, its contained object, the, uh, the function call overhead, the profile of function, calling functions on that thing is exactly the same. If I call value on uh, one of those uh, types you saw before or the erased types uh, value member, I, I get the same thing. I get virtual function dispatch. It's the same. Uh, behavior, but I have to do a lot more heap allocations, right? So if I construct something with traditional polymorphism, I'm going to usually uh, dynamically allocate that on the heap. And um, with uh, the simple form of type erasure I've showed you so far, I'm going to do the same thing. But then when I also copy it or assign the type erasure version, I'm going to have to touch heap as well. And uh, worst of all, the whole point of this was I want to be able to use different types with the same interface or take one object and use it with different interfaces, like the button I used as a layout, uh, a layoutable and as a widget. Um, in order to do that, every time I bind it to one of those two, I have to, I have to again touch heat. So that, that's kind of a problem. Um, the reason I put that asterisk there by the no under inheritance and getting an alternate interface is that um, you can have these bolt-on interfaces like talked about before and, and get multiple interfaces out of something. Use multiple inheritance, multiple inheritance to do that. But um, again, that's, that's a non-polymorphic use of that, of that uh, type. Okay, so let's see how, how we can optimize this. So step one, we can accept uh, CREF and REF and we'll contain a REF wrapper, okay? And uh, this is just for exposition. This is showing the, complica the complications that this entails. I'm not ask you to grok this, it's not important. There'll be code later that you can look at. Um, but it's getting complicated enough that I'm gonna stop showing you implementation details from here on. Uh, and then you need this specialization so that if you're given a reference wrapper, you actually hold it as a tref instead of a reference wrapper so that everywhere in the implementation we just say dot foo dot bar, whatever the member name is, we don't have to say get and then whatever the member is. Okay, so for um, using refs instead of uh, just copying everything all the time. The allocation profile did not change at all, but now we don't have to copy the underlying object for any of these operations as long as we pass in a, a ref or CREF, okay? And if we want to get rid of the dynamic allocations, we can try maybe doing a copy and write wrapper, okay? Um, that's gonna mean that in this example, we create a, a, a widget from a, a button and uh, that has to touch heap just to construct the thing. And then we have this W2 we make from W1, and there's no copy there. 
But if we want uh, mutable access to it by calling the right member of the wrapper, then that's where the copy happens. Uh, copy on write has a nice side effect that um, you get thread safety in many cases for free. Um, that is simply because when you want to mutate an object, you're never mutating the object itself, you're always mutating a copy. So if you structure the code with lots of these objects around, you get to um, essentially pass objects around by value uh, and they are ref counted. Um, so there's atomic ref counts in place. You pass them around by value and even though it, that, that sounds like you're using a shared pointer kind of uh, thing under the covers, in fact, it, it is equivalent to a shared pointer. One of the implementations I have here that you'll see in the code online, if you look, is done in terms of shared pointer, but it's a const reference to those things. So that's, that's fine to have uh, shared uh, immutable um, uh, references. Okay, so shared pointing rather than atomic, uh, atomic then it just works. It yeah, works. right, it just works. Right, and, and it is. Um, I, I stole, uh, the, the copy itself has to be safe. Uh, it is, I, I stole Sean's, uh, Sean Parent's implementation, so I'm, so I'm pretty works. sure it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so now that we've got uh, this copy on write approach, we don't pay for copies and assignments anymore in terms of touching heap, right? That's great, but now we have to touch heap twice. We have to do two dynamic allocations for the construction and binding to an alternate interface. And, and in case it's not clear, binding to an alternate interface and construct for the, type erasure case are effectively the same thing. I only put them separately because they're not the same thing in the, the uh, traditional inheritance case. Okay, so now if we integrate the copy on write, the stuff that the wrapper is doing into our type erased type, uh, or the scaffolding in, in, our, in our erased types, then um, we get the same benefits, uh, but only, only going to uh, the heap one time. Okay, so now forget all about the copy on write stuff. If we just do the small buffer optimization instead, what does it look like? Well, we can, we can assign a one into an anything uh, without going to the heap. We can assign uh, a, um, a ref in there because uh, you know, reference wrapper is also pretty small. But if we, some, for some reason, need to create um, an erase type that's gonna hold on to this thing for a long time, it's just not just temporarily binding to an interface with a ref or something, then of course we can't avoid the allocation. And that, that's what this looks like. So again, small buffer optimization allows anything, you know, small is on the left, large is on the right, for all the small objects, including references, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have to go to the heap, and, and for large ones, we do. Okay, so now if we put both of them together, I won't dwell on this, because I'm just showing you things I already showed you in the previous two slides. If we put both of them together, we get this nice profile. We, when we have to construct something from a large object that won't fit in the small buffer, and we're gonna hold on to it, and that's where it's gonna live forever, we're not just binding it to an interface temporarily, like an erase type interface, then we have to pay for heap allocation. And uh, every time we do that, binding to an alternate interface again is the same thing, we have to pay for that. If the object is small enough that it fits in a small buffer, we don't do a heap allocation. And, and if we're just binding to something temporarily, we don't do a heap allocation. And even if we have one of these large objects we had to copy uh, its value of and, and uh, dynamically allocate memory for it, copy and assignments are, are free just like you're using a pointer with traditional inheritance. And this is actually the point at which we are able to beat traditional inheritance in terms of heap allocations in some cases. Because something like that button example from before, I used it as a layout, uh, layoutable and then as a widget. Uh, in that case, I didn't have to dynamically allocate that button and uh, I didn't have to use reference semantics as I would have if, if that was using traditional inheritance. I would have created that button on the stack and then I would have had to have references to the widget or layoutable that I was passing, or uh, sorry, references to the button as I passed it in uh, as a widget or a layoutable. And I'll ask you the same thing. Go ahead. Uh, exactly <laughs> the scoped allocator model like this. That's the scoped allocator That's model? Exactly. Okay. Allocator, not by reference, by but same thing. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, the implementation is kind of hairy. It's, it's online, you can look at it later. Okay, so what are the wins and losses of these, these kinds of approaches? First, you get value semantics. That, that hopefully speaks for itself. Like I said, you should really go see one of Sean Parent's talks online about this. It's, it's very, very important for how you reason about code. Uh, you don't have to write new and delete explicitly. That's nice. Um, you can bind to interfaces that you've never seen before. So when you write your base class, you don't have to know about all the interfaces you're gonna have to support, and you don't have to bolt stuff on later. Uh, you get a lot of nice thread safety um, characteristics from the copy on write uh, approach. 
Uh, although, well, I'll get to that in a minute. And then you actually get the elision of heap allocations in some cases that you would have to do with a traditional inheritance, the thing I just mentioned earlier. Now, the implementation is hairy, right? That's, I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, and you get thread safety, uh, and if you don't need the thread safety, you're running in a single uh, thread context, then you're paying for all these uh, you know, atomic operations, and so you don't wanna do that if you don't, if you don't need that. Okay, so there's another option, which is not rolling your own, but using uh, boost type erasure, the, 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 the best library for doing type erasure ever made. I, 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 I know of them all, and this is the best one for sure. Uh, it uses metaprogramming uh, to generate a V table that's in the object, and that's how it gets its polymorphism. Okay, so uh, you give it a bunch of different interfaces that it has to have, and then it will um, run through those interfaces and make a V table entry for each element of that interface that it needs. Uh, it supports cast directly to the held type, just like uh, boost any. I don't have that in mind because I consider that a, a code smell. In some rare cases, you might need it, but the, the majority case is that I've got an interface I want to support, and I don't need to cast to some underlying type. I just want to use it with that interface, and I don't need a cast. Um, it can support uh, free function and operator uh, requirements on the types that it will bind a, an erase type to. So you don't have to just say like it has this member and that member, it can also have free functions that take an object of that type and that can be part of the requirements. It can have associated type requirements like it has to have a, you know, a, um, a, a nested type member with a certain, uh, a certain uh, uh, the, the, of a certain type or what have you. And then there's concept maps that are very much like the C++11, uh, pre-C++11 concepts proposal. So here's his example from uh, the online docs. He's got an MPL vector and that vector is specifying the interface has to be cop has to include copy constructability, incrementability, O streamability, and this type ID underscore thing is how, how you specify that I want to be able to cast to this type. That the casting to the underlying type is optional. So if I create a, uh, one of these ennies on the stack and I give an int 10 to it, I can increment that, I can stream it out, it does what I expect. If I uh, want to use uh, a member function, I have to do a little bit more work. There's this macro that you have to, to use, and that defines this type called has pushback. And then you can see in this function, append many uh, will, take an, uh, will take anything that conforms to that has pushback interface. And in this case, the interface is void int. Uh, the particulars of that pushback is that it's void int. And that underscore self ampersand is the way to say, take this thing by reference, not um, uh, not, don't copy it, right? So that when you do the, uh, the pushbacks on this container, it's visible outside the, the function, right? That's the whole point. Um, this is a little verbose. Uh, and, oh, I thought there was a question. And um, there's some other caveats to this library. First of all, if you have, um, if you want to use this with objects with a pretty small data footprint, but they have a large API you want to use them with, you're going to pay for that V table uh, a lot, right? It's going to make these objects much larger than you want in some cases. Um, the metaprogramming can make long compile times. If you make a mistake while you're writing one of these types, you're, you're in for some fun times looking at those error messages. And the small buffer optimization is not supported. It's gonna go to the heap uh, every time you assign an object. And uh, writing const member function, I should maybe not have said that this is not straightforward. It's just that if you do make a mistake, you have to repeat const in several places. If you make a mistake, it's impossible to understand that that's the error that you made. Okay, so let's compare that to inheritance and the hand-rolled stuff I've showed you before. So we have left is small objects, middle is um, uh, large objects, and then uh, right is references. So the previous profile that I showed you is the same thing repeated here for the optimized type erasure hand-rolled stuff. And then for the boost type erasure library, on every construction copy assignment or uh, of any kind, you're gonna have to go to the heap and copy the underlying object, and that's regardless of whether it's large or small because there's no small buffer optimization there. Okay, so space requirements, um, if you care about this, then it's um, important to note that, again, the boost type erasure objects will grow as their API grows. That's pretty significant in some cases. And the, um, uh, the small buffer optimization version of the type erasure stuff that I've got is, uh, has that buffer. And so if you're always using it with large objects and you're never gonna be able to fit in that buffer, you're gonna pay for that buffer all the time. So keep that in mind. Okay, so like I said, the implementation of these things is a little bit hairy, and you're gonna repeat the code over and over again. You've got uh, to repeat all the API, uh, you know, all the, all the elements of the API, three places, and so forth. So um, how do we get away from all this cutting and pasting? All right, well, we generate it, okay? So I've got this tool that I'm calling them typing due to lack of imagination. 
And um, so what you can do is you can take uh, uh, a, a file that has all your, what I'm calling archetype types, right? So a bunch of structs that have a certain name and have a certain API to them. And this thing using libclang will slurp up that, that header file. Uh, will look at those types and do a bunch of generated uh, erase types that allow you to use uh, anything that conforms to that interface as one of those, okay? So this is just a simple command line uh, example. It's, it's very straightforward. Uh, all the um, erase types that I used in the slides earlier, is uh, they were all generated using this tool. Okay, so your input is a real header. Um, so we're using libclang, which is a real front end, and so we can use real headers. And so you can have include guards in there, they're preserved. You can have headers in there, uh, they get, their inclusion gets preserved. Um, namespaces and the relative positions of your types within those namespaces are also preserved. Uh, any struct or class definition gets converted to an erase type. Those can actually be templates because it was free for me to do that, even though it's a wonky thing to do, why not? Uh, and everything else goes away, right? Libclang doesn't know anything about macros and comments pretty much. So they're going away for that reason, and all the other stuff, I'm just not bothering with them, okay? So here's an example of the input that you would write. You've got some uh, include guard. You're including IO stream. Maybe that should be IOS forward uh, so that you can get the std O stream that you need for loggables one uh, member. It's log member, okay? And this is, you know, again, real input, and this is the real output. Now, I've cut out all the huge spew of, <laughs> of stuff that we don't care about. That's all the boilerplate stuff you're trying not to, to do, right? But this is what it, it outputs besides that. So it preserved the include IO stream that, that we had in the archetypes uh, header file, the input header file, preserved the uh, include guard. It added these, these, these other headers <clears throat> that um, it needs to do the implementation of the erased type. And uh, there's a little dance here because no except is not defined yet for uh, Microsoft's latest compiler, but then you can see it's got this implementation that's, that's very straightforward and looks a lot like what you saw in earlier slides. All right, so it does this based on a form file. So the form file is essentially like all that stuff that's cut out right there. Um, and then it's got a few tags for like, you know, the name of the struct so that, that will get re repeated for the name of the erased type and for uh, all the places where the constructors are declared. and um, it will um, also take a block of headers. So if you have a different, like if you, if you have a different form file you want to supply that does different stuff in a different way, you might have a different set of headers you want to include, but the headers only come in once. You don't want to repeat them for each form. So they're, not, they're separate from the form file. And um, all of the um, versions of type erasure that I showed you during this talk have a form file that's available in this. Uh, so if you go look at the code afterwards, you can generate any of the code along the lines of any of these things. Um, and uh, I believe that's it. So uh, this is not live yet. It will be very shortly after the talk, and you can go check it out, and uh, I have plenty of time for questions. Questions? No one? Chandler. Um, do you have an analogous recommended practice for actual concept hierarchies where you want a hierarchical relationship? Do I have a... Let's, let's go to the microphones from now on, actually. <laughs> so that, that, that's fine. Uh, so do I have an analogous recommendation for how to do hierarchies? Um, generally, no. Uh, the reason being that I, I don't want hierarchies. Um, I, I want to have an interface that has a certain um, amount of stuff in it. And if I have to repeat some part of that interface, because there's a related type that has a slightly different interface, then I just repeat that. Um, there is perhaps a way to do that I'm not aware of it. So, anyone else? All right, thanks. <laughs>